Most of you were informed that uh, Bess England uh, um, acquired, contracted uh, um, COVID. Uh, she's in a, um, uh, um, a home uh, hospice. Um, I haven't uh, been in contact with her. I've not quite sure what's going on there, but obviously I'm not going by, um, but uh, keep her in your prayers because she's got cancer and that's running its course. And so um, probably not a good thing. To, huh? Beth. Bess, England. Uh, and so um, Anyway, if you guys would uh, just keep her in your prayers and the whole England family. I haven't seen them for a while, obviously, for whatever reasons. Um, so um, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 uh, today, but uh, I'm going to pray for Bess and maybe a few others here uh, before we get going. Um, Lord, we uh, uh, come to you, and uh, Lord, we call on the name of Jesus on Bess's uh, behalf and that of the whole family, Lord, uh, that, Lord, you would be with them this day, that you would touch them, that you would, uh, Lord, make your presence known to them. We ask and pray, God, that uh, uh, this COVID virus, Lord, would not... Uh, Lord, uh, take Beth down. We continue to pray that you would heal her from her cancer, Lord. Uh, and uh, so we just lift up uh, Beth and her whole family, and we ask and pray, God, just, uh, Lord, be gracious to them. Come and minister to them uh, this day. Some are probably watching online, and uh, Lord, we just uh, call down blessings upon them in Jesus' name. Father, we lift up Russ and Charlotte as they prepare to travel to uh, Texas, and uh, we pray you be with them, cover and protect them. Lord, we lift up Sue Roth, who, uh, Lord, is just kind of sitting in limbo with cancer, and yet, uh, Lord, is not full-blown, and uh, Lord, and yet her body has been racked by two rounds of chemotherapy. Lord, we ask and pray that you would touch her and heal her. 
And bless the whole family, the whole Roth family, Lord. And uh, be with Vicki today. God, uh, help her body to sustain all the transplant, organ transplant, half a heart, Lord, that's mechanical. Lord, we pray that you be with her and John this day. And for Liz, uh, Lord, we pray, God, for, for Liz Bailey, that, Lord, you would uh, keep them safe, keep her safe as her immune system is down. And, Lord, we lift up Mary, and we pray, God, you would just cleanse her body from the cancer and the treatments that she's going through. Lord, bless her, fill her heart with your love. And, Lord, I, I could pray for a long time here, but uh, we pray, Lord, touch each one of us this day. Come here, meet with us, Lord. Fill our hearts with your love. We sing about living water, Lord. We need to, we need a drink. Lord, we need to be satiated by the living God. And so, Lord, we ask and pray today that, Lord, as we hear your word, that it would stir up faith, that, Lord, we would come and, Lord, we would receive from you, Lord, just a, a great blessing of your presence in our heart, the love of God shed abroad by the Holy Spirit. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're not going to go far today, but that shouldn't shock anybody. Um, so if you're with me, we will read the first two verses of 1 Corinthians. Dun, 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 the herd of turtles. Here we go. So uh, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Susthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus, our, our, uh, on Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. And so this is the beginning of is writing to them, and uh, we're going to kind of run through and unpack and uh, kind of give you an overview of why this letter was written, what was going on, give you a little bit of history, um, because uh, um, this is a letter that's very corrective. Uh, Paul has major issues. This church has some major issues uh going on as you as we get into it and go through the chapters you'll understand because you'll be dealing with specific some that they wrote about other things that others told them about that were going on in the church now just to give you a reflection of corinth itself it's a very pagan society licentious society it was a society that was based upon uh, originally, uh, the major temple there was for Aphrodite or Venus, if you would have it, which is all about sex. That's what it is. It's all about, uh, you know, uh, the worship of uh, the female body and sex and pleasure and all that that goes along with that. They also had other uh, temples that were there a temple to Apollos, where there were homosexual uh, prostitutes, and they were available to anybody in the society also. And we'll we'll get into that a little bit further, and you know when you get into chapter six of First Corinthians. So this is a society that has given itself over to sexual pleasure, probably every other type of pleasure. I know I went through this before a hedonistic society, uh, a very short-sighted society. And as the terms go, if you were called a Corinthian, you were basically a person of the world that indulged in the world. You know, um, uh, Sin City is what this place was all about. And so God chooses to go in and send Paul to this city and draw a people for his name out of this city, out of this culture. And God's call is effective, but at the same time, we know from the Bible that, uh, 
You know, we have our own battles, each of us, in this world. Uh, we're not to be of this world, but we are in this world. And this world wants to get back into us. It wants to draw us away and get us ensnared and entrapped. And, you know, uh, that's the battle. That's the way that it goes when churches are planted. I mean, Ephesus was no different. They had, uh, you know, the Temple of Diana. They also had temple prostitutes. So, you know, the Church of Ephesus, uh, you know, had uh, some similar battles. Every culture has that. Every place where the gospel goes, God is pulling from a sinful culture and sanctifying those people and so there's the battle that goes back and forth. And again, each culture has its own particular persuasion. And these people would have been Greek in their thinking. So they were very much into knowledge. Okay. And that, you know, transferred over probably into their Christian uh, understanding that they were, you know, they were they didn't, they had some stinking thinking, the best way I can tell you, you know, that uh, they pulled in things of the world and that influenced their Christian walk. Uh, it's not like it hasn't happened in the church throughout the, the, the centuries, the millennia. You know, it has, where the world creeps in. There's a, a parable, and I, I believe it's in Matthew, it's a parable of the kingdom, and it's about the mustard tree. And the mustard tree grows up into this, uh, really not a normal mustard tree, but a large mustard tree. And the birds of the air come and nest, nest in the mustard tree. And the birds, for, you know, when you get into that passage, the birds are evil. There's no other way to put those birds, and you don't have to go back to Genesis, you just go to what Jesus said, the parable of the sower, the birds come and snatch the seed. That makes them what? Messengers of Satan. So when you interpret going down through those parables, you all of a sudden don't make the bird something different. Doesn't work like that. So it is where Satan joins the church. He infiltrates and he, and he comes in and he gets the church bound up by sin. That, you know, doesn't mean that people aren't saved when we battle with sin. That's not the issue. But the issue is there is a culture that goes back and forth. And I'm to be in the word and I'm to look to the word as my standard for my walk so that I'm growing in sanctification, if you would have it. So anyway, that's kind of a background. So uh, this, uh, Paul had multiple dealings with this church. I'll give you a, a, a rundown of the times when we know that Paul visited this church. First of all, last week, chapter 18 of the book of Acts. He goes there in fear and trembling. He gets there. God says, don't be afraid to speak. I have many people in this city. There is a church that is raised up right next to the synagogue, right? And it is a, it is a powerful church. God is doing a great work within this church. And so he is there for at least 18 months, according to the text. Probably longer than that, depending on when that 18 months starts. Okay, so maybe a couple of years. What would it be like being under Paul for a couple of years being taught the word of God? Well, uh, probably pretty powerful, but at the same time, they, like me, are forgetful hearers. Am I the only one? Husbands, are you forgetful hearers, or are you just selective in your hearing? <laughs> yeah, they all went, no, yeah, we listen really well, right? Okay, yeah, but this is the way that we are, you know, and there's lots of influences that comes into our lives and lots of different things and lots of doctrines and lots of questions and lots of stuff. Well, these people, when Paul left, there was other teachers that were raised up and apparently 
Apollos and Peter came there, and Apollos was a golden tongue, you know, orator, and uh, you know, so there was other guys that that came through, but Paul was their what? Their father. He was the one. He's the originator. It doesn't mean it's like a pyramid scheme type of a thing. He wasn't taking money from them, but he did have the apostolic authority. He was what the founding pastor if you would have it and so that's his first trip there is a uh, uh, a second time when Paul um, what do I got um, I already lose my page I did um, there is a, a a second visit that you would have and it's called the painful visit, and it comes from uh, 2 Corinthians 2.1. Uh, but I determined this within myself, that I would not come again to you in sorrow. So that tells us somewhere in between, there was a visit that Paul had with, with the Corinthians. He had gone there, we have no record of it in the book of Acts, but he had come there to challenge them over some of the things that he's probably going to be writing about and dealing with in this book. And then there was the third visit, which is after the end of 2 Corinthians. And if I haven't lost you, I'm sorry. I'll lose you before the end of the day. But I need to get this stuff out because there was multiple visits, multiple things that were going on. Um, he wrote four letters. We only have two. We have 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, but there was probably 1 Corinthians is actually 2 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians is probably 4 Corinthians, but we lost the other two. In other words, God didn't lose them. He just didn't feel like they were important, but Paul wrote multiple letters to this church. Two of them we have, and two of them that we do not have. Um, and there was a third letter was a severe letter. He wrote to them, he challenged them, just like a, a visit that he had, which was a severe visit. He went to challenge them. He went to challenge them and the things that they were doing because they were rejecting his authority and they were rejecting the word of God. Remember, the Bible was not written, the New Testament at that time. So the apostles were doing what? They were writing the Bible. That was part of their equipment. They were writing the Bible. What they were teaching was doctrinally sound because that's what God had commissioned them for. Okay? So, um, and then we get a fourth book, which is 2 Corinthians. And there was information that was transferred to Paul back and forth in some of these meetings and some of the people and things that the Corinthians themselves had questions about. We'll get into that in the book about marriage and a few other different things. Uh, Paul is going to talk about that, that they had written to him asking questions about certain positions doctrinally, if you would have it. Um, but the letters were written for specific reasons. 1 Corinthians 1.11, For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of close household, that there are contentions among you. The first thing he's going to deal with in 1 Corinthians is contentions. What's a contention? It's a fight. It's divisiveness. It's a division. And who tells him? Clo, close household, right? So there's communication. Um, in 1 Corinthians 5.1, it is actually reported there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles and a man as his father's wife. That'll be dealt with. But he's saying this is coming from other people. This isn't coming from you, Corinthians. It's coming from people from your church that are coming and telling me this is what's going on in the church. But to tattletales. No, they have a good reason for this is they want to clean it up. You know, Paul needed to know these things. In 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen, 18, 
For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. And so he's writing again about them taking communion and what's going on. And I'll just do a little thumbnail deal for that was the rich were eating over here and the poor had nothing to eat because it was a mixed society, right? Not everybody had the same social standards. And so Paul says, hey, this ain't right. You know, if uh, you guys can't share your food with everybody, don't bring it. My mom used to tell me that. If there's not enough for everybody, don't go over there. Don't take your food and eat in front of people. You know, that's what I was taught. Well, these people apparently weren't taught that. Some are over here feasting on turkey and pheasant, and others over here just looking and drooling. That ain't right, right? Eat at home if that's what you want to do, but don't come and shame the people that don't have anything by not sharing with them because you're part of the body. And we'll get into that when we get there. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 1. Now concerning the things which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So they wrote a letter and they had some questions about, obviously this one is about marriage. And then in 1 Corinthians 16, 17, I am glad about the coming of Stephanus, Fortunatus, Fortunatus, and I can never do these justice. Eight kid, that guy too. And what was lacking on your part, they supplied. So there was other visitors that came, a group of people, because he wrote this from Ephesus. That's where he wrote this book from. So they had to cross the Aegean Sea. So when you get into 2 Corinthians and you realize Paul was shipwrecked, Paul was sunk, Paul had a night and a day in the ocean. Well, now you know why, because he was constantly going back and forth across the Aegean Sea. And apparently, uh, being on a ship in their days were pretty dangerous stuff. You know, boats sank a lot. Uh, so I can't say that's the way it was when I was a fisherman. I mean, I knew a few boats that sank, but uh, nothing like Paul went through, you know. Um, so... That's the issue, the best I can kind of synopsize it for you, is there's just this information going back and forth between Paul trying to straighten things out in this church um, and uh, deal with the issues that they're dealing with so that they can be set apart for the Lord because the church is to be unified. I was... Uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, you might want to read it, where it says God, and he, and he gives office gifts with, uh, but they're not just office gifts, they are gifts with uh, power. Some apostles, some prophets, pastors, and teachers uh, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, is what Paul would write there. Well, uh, what is... What is the purpose? And we can run into all kinds of purposes. Well, the church is to evangelize. I agree. But there's a lot of things that go into that. There's a lot of things that, that are involved with that. That doesn't mean that you're the guy that's going to go into the grocery store and have 16 people standing there and stand up on the, you know, next to the cash register and start preaching the gospel. Most of you are like, do what? Right? Well, my first pastor, Karen and I first pastored, he was really bold. He could do that kind of stuff. And he expected everybody else to do it. And I had to learn some things about uh, him and about myself. And that was, God called me the way that I was. And he could use me to evangelize. I have no problem with that. But I didn't have to be that guy. Okay, I didn't have to be that guy. I just got to be me. I just got to be available to the Lord and what? Growing in the Lord. Because out of a growing church is where evangelism actually happens. Right? 
That doesn't mean that each of us doesn't have an opportunity or shouldn't have an opportunity to share. But at the same time, your gifts may be predominantly body oriented where, you know, in some people's case, they're outwardly oriented and they can, you know, evangelize very easily. Well, don't condemn yourself. Ask God what he wants to do. And if you feel like you're, you know, not doing what he wants you to do, then pray for the power of the Holy Spirit. That God would work with you the way that you are through his power. Because that's literally what I see in the Bible. That's the way that it is. It's not by what? I beat myself. I'm going to become somebody different. I'm not. You know, I'm not uh, opposed to evangelism. I very much believe in evangelism. But at the same time, uh, you know, it is, there's a whole bunch of gifts in this room because there's a whole bunch of, people in this room. Got it? Right? Are you all an I? You cyclops, you. <laughs> right? Are you all an ear? You know, are you all a mouth? Oh my. You know, mega mouth. You know, I mean, we're not. We're all part, right? We're all, we're all, you know, it's God's doing. And he is able to equip us for those things. But, you know, the church is to evangelize. We call ourselves evangelicals, right? But, uh, and if you don't have the boldness and you pray for those who are on the front lines of that, I encourage you. I wanted to say the, 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 the team that was up here, I hope you pray for them. They do this volunteer. Everybody in this church does everything volunteer. I'm the only non-volunteer here, you know. I'm the only slave here. No, I mean, but that's the way that it is. We need to be praying for each other because these are sacrificial things, but we need to encourage one another because it can get discouraging serving the Lord. Or am I the only one that has that problem? <coughs> right? So... Anyways, uh, so, you know, the church is to glorify God. Well, what brings glory to Jesus Christ? When people trust him, they give their lives to him, that they become what? Part of the family, the household of faith, right? That's... Anyways, so let's go back to our two verses, and we'll start out again. Paul. Paul is a uh, Latin-based name. It's not Hebrew. Saul is his Hebrew name. He took on the Latin-based name. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. Who was he going to be predominantly ministering to? Gentiles. He was a Roman citizen. And so somewhere along the line, it transferred from what? Saul to Paul, right? And uh, so, you know, whatever the reasons are, it's not given us specifically why he changed the name. They sound very similar, but uh, why he changed the name. But he did change his name, and he says, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. What is an apostle? Well, an apostle is somebody who is a ambassador uh, commissioned by God to represent God. Um, and has special gifting. And one of the criteria was they had to see the risen Lord. That is actually in, in scripture, having seen the risen Lord. And there's a few guys that are called to be apostles that are not of the original 11 or 12, if you would have it, or Paul. Barnabas is called an apostle. There's a few others. Whether they saw the Lord uh, the way, uh, it, we have no testimony of that, but we know that Paul did because Jesus met him on a road shining like the noonday sun, knocked him off his donkey and said, how do you like that, buddy? No, that's not what he said, but that's, 
you know, basically exactly what he did, right? But he says, I was called by God, you know, and one of the important things that everybody needs to know as a, a believer, or in their case, this case for an apostle, is we're all called by God. We're all called. And God's call is effective. It is. It was effective in Paul's case, do you think? Very effective, right? In fact, so effective that uh, when uh, Ananias, you know, heard about him coming and said, you're going to bring that guy to my house? Are you out of your mind, Lord? That's not what he said, but I believe that's what he was thinking. He's like, this guy's got warrants for my arrest. He's coming to take me away. Aha, he's coming to take me. Oh, sorry. You guys don't remember that old rock and roll song. I don't even know if it was rock and roll. It was just some lunatic. What was it? Frank Zappa? Yes. They're coming to take me away. Oh, 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 he, he. Sorry. Man, get that man some sedation. Anyways, in Acts 9, 15 through 16, you can read the whole chapter of 9, but it says, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Can you imagine that? Knocks him off his donkey, brings him in, he's blind. He tells Ananias, go down, find the guy. And he says, I'm going to show him what's going to happen in his life. He said he's a witness of mine to stand. And you can actually find his life in this. To, uh, to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. And he did all of that. He stood before the king of the then known world, Caesar. Right? And he stood before the children of Israel multiple times. Right? And, uh, and then he says, I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Is that what he signed up for? That's exactly what he signed up for. But you see, the call that God had given, the impact that the Lord had on his life, he didn't care. He didn't care. It impacted him so profoundly, he didn't care. So, he says, uh, an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and then he adds, Susan, he's our brother, who was quite possible the ruler of the uh, synagogue in chapter 18 of the book of Acts, who was beaten, if you remember, he brought the charges and then was beaten. It's quite possible he actually got saved. We don't know. I mean, it's a popular name, apparently, in the Greek culture, but could have been the guy. He could have got converted. Never know. You know, everybody's a candidate, that's for sure. So, Paul puts his credentials out there first because, believe it or not, they're challenging who he is. And so he throws out there, right from the beginning, he says, I was called by God, guys. Man did not call me. You know, you can go into the book of Galatians where he go, runs through... Uh, you know, his call and how, you know, he didn't receive his gospel from the apostles of that day, that he got it from the Lord. He only had minimum contact. There's, there's no way he kind of, could have come up doctrinally with his positions in the brief amount of time that he sent with Peter and the church at, at, at Jerusalem. He's saying, no, I, this was given to me by God out in the desert, and he's the one that clarified it for me. So he's saying, I was called by God, I am his apostle, and that will have ramifications for the rest of the things that he writes and many of the challenging things he did that he will write to them. That's the basis of his authority, right? So he says, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, the word for church is ecclesia, in the Greek, 
common language. It's just an assembly of anybody. You know, if you're assembled down at Aphrodite's, you know, that's an assembly. Not necessarily a good assembly from God's point of view, but it's an assembly, right? But if you go back to the Septuagint, the translation of the Old Testament into the Greek language, this word is used for what? God's unique people, Israel. And I believe that's exactly why it's used here. Paul is not saying any ordinary, right, congregation, any ordinary grouping of people. No, this is an extraordinarily unique group of people, just as Israel itself was God's unique nation, right? Doesn't mean we replace them, so please don't anybody ever accuse me of replacement theology. We don't replace the Jews, but God has definitely put the Jewish nation on hold for a season to bring in the Gentiles, to bring in the church. When the church age is over, he's going to go back and deal with the Jewish nation. He still loves them. He's still with them. You know, for those of you who go walking through the mall over there, uh, the girl at the, the selling the Dead Sea stuff, her name is uh, um, Victoria. Yeah. Tell her you're from our church when you go by. Tell her you're praying for her. So, because I'm building a little bit of rapport, and the guy that she works with is actually from Israel, too. And so, a little bit of rapport, and I, you know, I don't know. I'd like to give her some scriptures so that she would read them and say, who is this talking about, like Psalm 22 or Isaiah 53, you know, so that maybe I could get her thinking a little bit, you know, I don't know. So that's my prayer, is that I get an opportunity to say, you know what, your Messiah has already come. He's coming back again for you. So anyway, if you think about it as, as God leads, but the Ecclesia, it's a called out group of people. It's an assembly that God has called out. What are we? We are the church. We call ourselves the church. We are an assembly. We are part of the body of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. We're a living entity, not a sign-up sheet. I'm of this. No, that's not the way this works. You may be on the roster of a church. That's fine. But that doesn't make you on the roster in heaven. The roster in heaven is my faith in Jesus Christ and God's spirit making me a new creation. It is literally God sanctifying me, setting me apart, calling me holy. And most of us go... How can he do that? I get it. I do. How can he do that? Because what Jesus did for us paid it all. Paid it all. Now, does that mean God wants me to stay where I'm at? No. He expects me to join him in my own sanctification, right? Growing in the Lord. But this group, they were called out, but he's uh, going to go on uh, and say, to those who are sanctified, that word is set apart. Part of the root of that word is holy. That's what set apart means. Holy. Called to be saints, hagios, holy ones. Two different words for holy for you and I. Us. That's what he says about us. But it's not just what he says. It's what he's done. He started a work. When I trusted in Jesus Christ, he sent his spirit into my heart. He gave me a new seed. And he started a new life within me. And when I started that new life, he already saw me as set apart and holy. Don't believe the Catholic Church. There's no saints like the Catholic Church. If 
you do so many miracles and do this and do that. That is not biblical. Biblical is when somebody, God calls someone out of the darkness to be inside of his son, you are hagios, you are holy. You're set apart by God. Now we have our battle with our set apartness, no doubt, you know. We have our battle with that, but at the same time, that's who we are. That's who they were. Now, let's consider this is Corinth, right? What kind of people were called out in Corinth? It tells us that there was all kinds of different people. There were people from the higher echelons of society with wealth and power, probably, you know, administrators and then the government. And then there were others. A matter of fact, Paul will write and he says, uh, he gives a list of all the people who, who will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Drunkards and homosexuals and sodomites and blah, 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 blah. But then he tags something down at the end, I believe it's in chapter 6. He says, but such were some of you. But he said, you were washed and you were cleansed and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. That's the church. That's the church. And some don't look like they need a lot of changing. And others look like, <laughs> change is impossible. Not so, folks. Not so. It's equal for all because we all fall short and we all need that, that new heart, that new start. And so he says, sanctified, called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord, are, are on Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So calling on the name of the Lord, what is calling on the name of the Lord? This is a, um, um, means to invoke. Anybody here ever heard of an invocation? Invocation means to invoke. When I came into Jesus Christ, I came into a new realm, a new sphere of influence, literally a new life under a new king with a new destiny and a new purpose. Because the Bible says everything became new. Everything became new. I was cleansed from sin. How did I do that? Did I get a bar of soap? Did I? No. It was something that God did when I trusted in Christ, or you trusted in Christ, or if you choose to trust him today. It's something that he does. And until he deals with that issue, you will continue to live after the world and in sin and have the death penalty awaiting you at the end of your time here on planet Earth because you'll be accountable for those sins. Well, when I trust in Christ, those sins are washed away. Not only is, does that transpire, but then God does a work in my heart by which I can do what? Actually fulfill his purposes. It's called sanctification. It's a process. But I'm already sanctified when I first trust Christ. I'm already ready for heaven. And I thought the church would fall in on me on the next Sunday when I walked in the doors waiting for the particular part of the church where I was standing to come crashing down on me. Yeah. So, call upon the Lord, invoke Merriam-Webster Dictionary to petition for help or support, to appeal to or cite as authority. What does it mean to invoke? It means to call on somebody for one, help or support to appeal or to cite as the authority. So when somebody invokes the name of Jesus, what are they calling on? 
the authority. Not only the authority, but the one who paid, right? To set me free. In Joel 2.32, Peter quotes from Joel 2.32 in the book of Acts when he's preaching his first message. And he says this, It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Shall be saved. The word for Lord there is our word, our, the translation YHVH, Jehovah. And so Joel is saying, if you cry out, you know his name, right? God gave the dialing, right? Dial God. But God has a name, not just God. God has a name. They knew the name. They've lost the specific name. They have what? The consonants. Y-H-V-H, tetragrammaton. You could say Jehovah or Yahweh. Those are the two basic translations, right? Today, we don't know specifically which one is which, but God gave Israel his name, his personal name, his personal email, his Twitter account, right? Facebook, however you want to put it, God said, I give you the opportunity to call on my name, and when God hears his name, does he go, oh, I don't know them. If you were to walk through that mall and somebody hollered out, I'm walking down the mall and somebody hollers out, Dennis, you think I'm not going to turn around? Dennis is not that popular of a name. Menace is. <laughs> no, just kidding. Right? I'm going to turn around and say, who's calling my name, right? Well, God gave Israel his personal name by which they could call upon him. A covenant name. Well, God gave us another name to call out. His son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. I can call on Jesus. And it is no different than for the Jews calling on the name of Jehovah. I call on Jehovah's Son. And when I call on Jehovah's Son, understanding what he has done for me, then God will answer. That is a promise from the Bible. That's an absolute promise. And it tells us, it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not maybe, not might be, not somehow your sin is too much for me. I can't deal with it. Shall be saved. Paul quotes this in Romans 8, 1 through 5, chapter 10, 8 through 15. What does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction, distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all. All is rich to all who call upon him. Invoke his name. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord or invokes his name shall be saved. It's a quote from Joel by Paul. Same quote. Same quote. And Paul is saying anybody that will call out in this name, understanding what Jesus has done, to the, to the illumination of the Holy Spirit, they will be saved. So information comes in through the gospel. Faith is stirred up, but it has to exit through my mouth. It has to be something that I speak out towards the Lord. Some say that's public
You have to say it. That's all I can say. And if you say it there, then you'll say it again. Because when you call out and you invoke the name of the Lord, when you invoke the Savior's name, it says you will be saved. So how were these people sanctified, set apart, called holy? Because they invoked the name of the Lord. They invoked the work of Jesus Christ. And so they were set apart, irregardless of what their past sins were. Made no difference. Irregardless of their social status in this life. Doesn't make any difference. The rich are welcome. The poor are welcome. The good, the bad, and the woo, 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 ugly. Sorry. So what does this look like? Man, I'm already out of time. We'll have to run through this. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase this. Joshua 6, 20 through 2, or Joshua 2, 21, chapter 2, verse 1 through 21. I'm going to paraphrase this. You can read it on your own. Two spies come into Jericho. They go to a woman of the evening. She's called a harlot. James even calls her a harlot in the New Testament. Her name is Rahab. Rahab hides him up in the flax upstairs. She sends what? They come looking for these guys. Ah, we know they're here. And the king sends his guards up there. And she says, they went away. If you, if you go, they're probably at the ford. You can catch them before they get there. If you drive your Volkswagen. No, just kidding. Anyway, you're Chevy. So she sends them away. And then she comes. And the amazing part is she invokes the name of Jehovah. She says, we know Jehovah destroyed Egypt. We know Jehovah gave you victory over Zion and Og. And we know that he's given you our land. There is fear of you upon all of us because of what? And she keeps using this name, the personal name of God. Where'd she get that? She heard about him. She heard great things about him. So she does what? She speaks about him in the personal pronoun of his personal name that was given to his covenant people. And she says, here's the deal. I want to get saved. I don't want to perish in this city, and I know God's going to give it to you. And so they make an agreement. They said, if you stay in this house and you put the scarlet cord out the, the window, then when we come and take this city, you will be spared. How could they promise that? Her house is on the, the, the wall. You guys know John Cougar Mellencamp's song, and the what? The walls came tumbling down. Well, that's the truth. It's about the only thing the guy ever sings is truthful, but that's the truth. The walls did come down. They came down flat. David knows this. He's gone through the excavations. He's got all the archaeological stuff. They came down flat. How is it that one house is still standing? Who was listening? Whose name was she calling on? That's right. And so God spares her and her household. And here it is. All the walls are down. All Everything's destroyed. And here's her house. Go get her, guys. Sends the spies in there. It says she was spared. But they put her out of the camp initially because she was unclean. We don't hear anything else about her in the Old Testament until we get into the New Testament in chapter 1 of the book of Matthew Verse 5, it tells us there's a guy named Salmon. Salmon, probably. We would call him Salmon. I don't know if he was a King Salmon or a Chinook Salmon or... No, he was... He marries her! Well, who is he the descendant of? He's a descendant of Judah. Who would come down a little bit 
later in his, his line, three generations down, David came from him. So I don't know how many great greats that is, but uh, David probably actually got to know Rahab. What kind of faith would this woman have? Obviously, she wasn't what she once was, a Canaanite, a cursed woman. God brought her into his covenant, right? Irregardless of who her parents were, had nothing to do with what? Descendants. It had to do with her faith. And she is brought in, and then she is what? Included in the line of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So what is it like to be in Christ? That's the picture. When she stepped out of that city, she turned her back on that city before it was ever destroyed. She turned her back on that culture and she said, I will embrace my new future with these people if God will spare me. That's exactly what she did. What does God want from us as his children? To do the same thing. To walk out of the world and come follow him, right? She couldn't stop what she thought. She didn't automatically just change, right? She had the process of being in God's word and growing in the Lord, but something was new. I do not believe she was a woman of the evening anymore. I don't believe she had to go sell her body to make ends meet. And she marries into the line of Christ, into the one of the, 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 the kingly tribe. And her descendants would be what? Kings. Who am I in Christ? I believe I'm speaking mostly to believers here. Who am I in Christ? Don't believe the lies of the enemy, folks. Psychology and all that stuff, it's a bunch of garbage. Walk away from that life, turn your back on it, and go forward with Jesus Christ. Satan is the one that wants to drag us down and say, you'll never be anything because you got too much baggage. Or if you need some bolt cutters, whatever it is, cut it loose. Go forward with the Lord. That's it. That's what he's called us to. The Bible, the New Testament is about who I am in Christ, not what I once was. I was once a rank sinner. And sometimes we so dig in in our sin, we just beat ourselves over our sin, and we don't accept God's grace. And I'm not giving you a license to sin, but man, don't let it dominate your life. Move on. Move on. I have victory in Jesus Christ. And if you've never trusted the Lord, invoke his name today. Jesus died for you. He paid everything for you. He said it's finished. There's nothing you could add to it, subtract from it. There's nothing you can do except receive it. But you need to turn your back on your own life, old life called repentance and look forward to the life that God has. You say, you don't know where I came from. You don't know what I've done. Oh, I know enough about my own life. Forward, not backward. Forward, right? Grace is grace. Don't minimize it, right? Grace is undeserved, unmerited favor. Just enjoy it. Or try to earn it. Then you just defeated the whole purpose. God does love you. If you've invoked that name, then you are in Jesus Christ. 
You're secure. Jericho fell. <laughs> Don't go back to the ruins. There's nothing there. Move forward. Lord, thanks for your word. I didn't quite go where I thought I was going to be going, but Lord, apparently we went where you wanted to go. So I pray, God, that your spirit would work effectively in us. The Lord, we would say yea and amen to who we are in Jesus Christ. And we would grow and move forward with you. So Lord, we thank you for loving us, Lord, and it is out of love that you did all of this. Because you saw our need. And you gave us the opportunity. And we said yes. We called on the name of the Lord. And nothing's been, nothing's been the same since that time. So I ask and pray, Lord, fall upon us by your Spirit. Fill us and empower us. And Lord, we pray that you give us the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. So as we go out this week, Lord, that we are rejoicing, we're uh, blessed, as the Bible says. Oh, how happy to be envied. And Lord, not that we provoke people to envy, but we are enviable because we have peace, we have joy. We know that our Savior is coming for us and that he loves us today and he's going to love us all the way into his presence. So I pray that you bless us as the sheep of your pastor, your people, your called out holy ones. In Jesus' name, amen.